What is up, Earth's Mightiest Subscribers? It's Ernie Blurred Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. Okay, so today's video, we're actually gonna be talking about Excalibur number 18 by Teeny Howard and Marcus Toe. And though I didn't cover Excalibur number 17, also by the same creative team, we are gonna talk a little bit about it. So there'll be some things that are gonna come up. But basically what you need to know is in this video, basically what we're gonna be talking about is how Betsy Braddock returned from being lost in the multiverse. And we're also gonna learn that maybe the Betsy we got back isn't exactly our Betsy. And more importantly, how the character Quanon who now goes by the moniker of Psylocke, how she is gonna be instrumental in both the return of Betsy Braddock and potentially saving Betsy Braddock's life. We're gonna talk about all this and more right now, but first, let's hit that intro. Word to wise, grass only greener when it's fertilized. Gave them truth in these songs, they prefer the lies. That's any beautiful adrift in her purple lies. You can't see me, you Stevie, wondering how I reach more evolutions than Evie and make it look easy. Okay, so Excalibur. I originally was gonna do a video for Excalibur number 17, but I just felt like there was really nothing there for me to offer you that was in regards of giving you any kind of further insight into uh, what's going on in the story arc. So I decided to just not touch it. I just decided to let it go, let it rest, and see what all would happen. But basically to give you a little recap as to what happened in Excalibur number 17, so you can better understand what I'm telling you here in regards to Excalibur number 18, is that we discovered that Betsy Braddock was lost somewhere in the multiverse and that the only way she could get back is by going to the lighthouse on that particular version of Earth, which would allow her to be reconnected to the rest of Otherworld. Because as some of you may or may not know, all points in the multiverse and Otherworld are connected by very similar anchors. And these anchors are lighthouses, even if they're not actually lighthouses in the traditional sense. But Betsy was able to, with the help of Angel, who in that reality is who she is dating, Angel was able to get Betsy help into infiltrating the lighthouse so that she would be able to return to Earth. And this help would come in the form of none other than that world's version of Angel's ex-wife, Quanin. Something that created a lot of tension, something that created uh, you know, some very uncomfortable moments for Betsy, uh, and even allowing these two characters to have a very uncomfortable conversation that didn't really go the way exactly I think Betsy had hoped for. But in the end, Quanin did help her and Betsy was able to go through the portal in the lighthouse and presumably return home. This was a big deal because at the same time, Clan Akaba, who are you know, technically tied to the character of Morgan Le Fay, they were trying to destroy the lighthouse at around roughly the same time because they felt that if Captain Britain wasn't present, regardless of whether she was a mutant or not, and the fact that they hate mutants, they were going to destroy the lighthouse because they felt that, well, for one, it would stop Betsy from returning because, you know, technically they don't really want Betsy to come back. They're really kind of bitter about her being Captain Britain. So they feel like if they can stop her from coming back, they can get the Captain Britain that they want. You know, this is yet again, more commentary on how how shitty fans can be about certain things and certain aspects of comics and one of those aspects being change. But all of that aside, Clan Akaba was thwarted and Betsy returned. Or did she? You see, in this issue, we actually are more following not so much Betsy, but Rogue. Rogue, who is one of Betsy Braddock's oldest friends, she is worried about Betsy because she just gets this sneaking suspicion, something ain't right. Now, when Betsy did initially return, she didn't really speak. She mostly spoke through telepathy, but she never really opened her mouth. It was almost as though she was intentionally trying not to talk. Uh, or at the very least, maybe she couldn't talk. But for all intents and purposes, Rachel Gray seems to be of the belief that this is in fact Betsy Braddock, that she is the same Betsy from Earth 616 and that her experiences are Betsy's. As far as she can tell, there's nothing wrong. But because Rachel knows that Rogue is so worried, she does offer to give Rogue a small smidge of her powers, allowing herself to be touched by Rogue physically so that she can transfer some of her psionic abilities over to Rogue, but warning her to be careful how she uses them. 
Now, where things start to get a little weird and what kind of let us know that maybe, just maybe, Betsy is not who we think she is, when Emma Frost appears and questions Betsy about what was going on, Betsy gets incredibly defensive. Now, this could just be chalked up to the fact that she's good old-fashioned angry, as Rachel Gray seems to believe as well, but Emma knows better. Something is not right and that something needs to happen. Because right now, the Quiet Council is trying to work with Otherworld, more specifically, her royal Royal Wyness, Queen Opal Luna Saturnine, in trying to come up with a way to mitigate how mutants who died in Otherworld can come back normal and not be these weird hollow shells of themselves. They're trying to find a way to work with her because they know Saturnine could actually fix this. And they know that working together is the only way to save those characters like Gorgon and Rockslide who died in Otherworld and came back a little wrong. But because of the lack of a Captain Britain, Opal Luna Saturnine refuses to meet with the mutants, and until they can get her back, they're not going to have any conversations with Saturnine. This is kind of why they're trying to expedite this whole, hey, can we get Betsy to get off her ass and, you know, start talking to us so we can make this happen. Well, things get even weirder when, while they're having dinner back at the lighthouse, Maggie, the daughter of both Megan and Captain Avalon, Brian Braddock, happens to come through one of the gates, and she sees Betsy, who is is her aunt and she calls out to her father going back through the portal and bringing Megan and Captain Avalon back through the gate and Betsy seems like something's wrong like something has disturbed her and she has to get the hell out of Dodge now conventional wisdom would probably make some people believe maybe just maybe she's not ready to see her brother but it goes a little deeper than that because when Maggie brings Brian Braddock back across the gate, we learn that he had no clue that she was back and he wants to see her. And of course, no one knows what how to tell him what's going on. No one really knows how to you know, break this news to him, but eventually Rogue does. And when Rogue tells Brian what she believes, that she believes this is not, in fact, the real Betsy Braddock, Brian reveals that he believes her. This is not his Betsy Braddock. This is not at all Betsy. This is an imposter. This is someone very likely from another edge of the multiverse, and the Betsy that we saw go through that portal in the lighthouse is likely not returned yet and may in fact still be lost in the multiverse and is somewhere else entirely. Things become even more complicated, however, when Brian decides to stay at the lighthouse overnight until they can figure out what's going on, and it just so happens that this imposter version of Betsy Braddock gets inside of Brian's head and has him lead her through the Kirkoan gates back to Avalon. Not only that, but she also puts a little bug in Rogue's mind, waking her up and leaving just enough of a breadcrumb, leading her to want to follow her through the gate as well. What Rogue is trying to do is she's trying to figure out if there's something that may be in Apocalypse's notes that could possibly help them figure out what's going on with Betsy. Maybe there's something in there that could save Betsy, and this is largely coming from Richter. Rogue really has no interest in this, but because Richter believes so heavily in the idea that there could be something there that Apocalypse may know something, Rogue is willing to give it a chance, even though she doesn't have the same level of respect for what Apocalypse was doing the way that Richter did. Richter, we can tell he was beginning to idolize Apocalypse and that he maybe learned a lot more from Apocalypse than we may have initially realized. He's actually trying to convince Rogue that the five, mutant synergy, the communion of mutant powers is something that Apocalypse was trying to teach them. And I find it really interesting that Rogue has actually seen this in action. She knows how the five work. She has actually used this similar ability before in Excalibur number 16 herself to try and figure out what was going on with Betsy Braddock. And that's how they ended up summoning the Captain Britons from the other side of the multiverse. She knows this works, but she keeps acting as if she doesn't have a clue. But at the end of it all, Apocalypse believes that magic and mutants, they go hand in hand and that because of the fact that mutants grew up in a world of humanity, they weren't allowed to come together and use their powers in the way that Apocalypse always knew mutants could. And Richter is trying to convince Rogue that that's what we need to get back to, but that's a conversation that I think is gonna largely wind up being held for another day because Betsy appears out of nowhere in full 
Captain Britain regalia and attacks Rogue and Richter, taking Richter down almost instantaneously before she lashes out and strikes down Rogue, getting ready to impale her with her psychic sword. But it just so happens Rogue is gonna get help in fighting this version of Betsy Braddock from one of the strangest places, and that is gonna be Quanin. Now, whether or not this is our Quanin who is now serving on the Hellions, or if this is the same Quanin we saw in the multiverse, that one is a little more nebulous, but I'm gonna go to limb and say, this is our Quanin from the Hellions, even though that version of Quanin is tied up right now. So I don't know, this was, it gets a little weird here, but basically Quanin shows up and she is prepared to help Rogue take down this pretender of Betsy Braddock. Now, the reason why I think that this is an imposter, if you go back a little bit, and I believe if you go back, it was like Excalibur number 16, where Jamie Braddock talked with Mr. Sinister about cutting a deal that would create a clone that he could use at any time. Originally, the deal they had struck during Ten of Swords was for Mr. Sinister to create him a clone for himself, that way, in case anything went wrong with the resurrection protocols or he was, you know, for whatever reason, barred from them, he could return. Well, it just so happened that because of the loss of his sister Betsy, he decided to change the deal and have a clone made of Betsy. The reason why I bring this up is because when Gambit goes to speak with Jamie to ask him whether or not he knows anything about what's going on with Betsy or if he's done something in regards to you know, what's going on with Betsy, did he create this imposter? While Jamie says that he is not responsible, while they're going through his castle in Avalon, Gambit realizes that Jamie still has Morgan Le Fay bound and in a catatonic state, still trapped in Otherworld in his castle. Remember that when Morgan Le Fay was defeated, Apocalypse experimented on her and was using her as a way to try and learn more about the nature of why Otherworld was rejecting Krakoan bioorganics. This was all in an aid to help him finally create the external gate that led into Ten of Swords. Well, I think the imposter is actually Morgan Le Fay in Betsy's clone body that Jamie had Mr. Sinister make. And the reason why I say that is because Jamie hid the body in an Iron Maiden right by Morgan Le Fay. And we all know Morgan Le Fay is very, very resourceful. Even in the state that she was in, I think it was safe for all of us to assume she was going to find a way out of that position. And she did because the body, as Jamie so boldly is about to present to Gambit to show him that he is on the up and up and that he is not responsible for this. When Jamie opens the Iron Maiden, Betsy's clone body is gone. So yeah, I think that the Betsy that we're dealing with, this Betsy who is attacking them, this is in fact Morgan Le Fay. I have no doubt about it. Morgan Le Fay is not dead. She has moved her soul, her spirit, her essence. She has moved it into that body that Jamie had created and she is now masquerading as the current Captain Britain. And this actually creates even more problems because if that is in fact the case, I wonder how Clan Akaba is gonna respond to this considering how much they hate mutants. That's gonna be very interesting to see but whatever is going on, Morgan Le Fay has plans for getting revenge against the mutants who Quotey Fingers killed her. And it's going to be very interesting to learn more about that. But yeah, that I thought that was really cool. There's also a really nice little note at the end of this book in regards to so you're kind of going back to Apocalypse and talking about his relationship with Richter. We learn that Apocalypse apparently left a will, a last will and testament on Krakoa because now that they know they can't die, they can you know, be resurrected. Apocalypse talks about how, oh, I never realized that you know, we would ever need things like a last will and testament. But one thing I love here, and I actually will read this, is that he does state in his last will and testament that I, Apocalypse of Krakoa, declare this will of my intent after I am gone and hereby revoke any existing wills or codices. To my apprentice, I leave everything. Richter, in the place in your heart where you have always seen a failure, there is instead a fault, a deep aching split in you that exposes a molten heat. You have always endured it. It is what I have always known about you. The great secret of the powers of Earth is that you must have a spirit that can stand to the heat beneath. Like Cypher is the only one who can hear Krakoa's words, you are the only one that can hear her heartbeat. This era among us has given you the power of the land, made you powerful in a way previously undreamt. It is why this magic must be yours. All I have learned and gathered of our magic 
I leave to you. As you read this, you know by now why I have done what I have done. Everything before now is prehistory. I leave it all in your hands. Now, this is in regards to something that was shown on the wall that when Richter was trying to talk with Rogue about the potential of the future of mutant magic. And I think it's really cool that, you know, Apocalypse found someone who is going to carry on his work even after he's gone. Now, the question is, is Richter going to be as secretive and inscrutable as Apocalypse was? Because, you know, Apocalypse was that way because, as Richter pointed out, he's been around for a long time. He's done more evil than anyone. He's done more good than anyone. And it's just kind of one of the things you live for thousands and thousands and thousands of years eventually you're going to start to realize that the world is not so much good and evil black and white it's all shades of gray and that's kind of where apocalypse felt that he fit in he didn't do things because they were wholly evil he did things because he, they needed to be done regardless of whether it fits some you know uh outmoded moral code that just he didn't abide by anymore and I'm curious to see where it's all going to go from here because right now, and as I've often said in regards to Excalibur comics under Teeny Howard's writing, is that a lot of times some issues may seem like they're going nowhere, but they're actually going somewhere. You just kind of have to be patient and wait for the rest of those crumbs to come together to get you know, where you're trying to go. And and while, yes, I did actually enjoy Excalibur number 17, I just felt it wasn't worth making a video about because there's really nothing to talk about. But in this case, I feel like there is something to talk about because we know so much more than what we did in the previous issues. That's for those of you who are fans of Excalibur, that's why I do Excalibur videos so sparingly. But I did enjoy this one and I feel like there was something here. There was a mystery and I feel like we've already solved it. We know what it is. We know that Morgan Le Fay is in Betsy's body, even though it hasn't been, you know, definitively stated i'm fairly positive about this and i think it's safe to say that richter is going to wind up becoming the person on the team that everyone's going to start watching because of how much he idolizes apocalypse and where or what he is going to do with the information he's been given that said i hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did enjoy this video hulk smash that like button and make sure to share this video all over the internet with all your friends so they can know how you leveled up your comic book big brain in regards to excalibur and reign of x also let me know what you thought about Excalibur number 18. Did you like it? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Hit me with your best shot. Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.